you know, as, as people are coming, I, I want to make sure I give a shout out to uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Tom Scholes and Nancy Berlin, who are both here today and helping uh, host this. So thank you, Virginia Cooperative Extension, for hosting this webinar. Thank you also to the Fairfax Food Council, uh, help lead urban agricultural initiatives on the Fairfax Food Council, which is working to try to make food more affordable and accessible here in Fairfax County. And we have Diane Charles, who's the coordinator. Also just a welcome from the Food Council and how excited we are to have Kathy Jentz and learn a lot, we hope, from her expertise in seed saving. So thanks for joining us. Thomas? Virginia Cooperative Extension is the educational outreach of Virginia Tech and Virginia State Universities. There are land-grant universities here in Virginia. And our mission is to get out research-based information, unbiased information to the general public. Tonight's speaker is Kathy Jentz. She, we were so grateful to you for being able to join us tonight. Kathy's um, editor and publisher of Washington Gardner Magazine. Their July issue has just come out. Her mission is to turn black thumbs green. She is a lifelong gardener and believes that growing plants should be stress-free and enjoyable. Her philosophy is inspiration over perspiration. She does keep a very active uh, Facebook page, Washington Gardener. I recommend you check it out. There's a lot going on and she's president of the Silver Spring Garden Club. So Kathy, thank you so much for for coming out with us tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Stacy, and, and thanks to our hosts again. We're here to talk about seed saving for everyone. We're going to cover the two major methods of seed saving, dry method and a wet method. And then I'm gonna go over some individual plants that I find easy to save seeds from, some that are harder, and some that I'm gonna tell you don't bother. How's that? <laughs> so we'll dive right in. Guess what? There's only 242 days until spring it comes back again. So for those of us who, uh, who are mainly in the Virginia, D.C., Maryland area who are sweltering through a serious heat wave like a lot of the rest of the country is, whew, spring is, is just around the corner, right? <laughs> so something to look forward to at least. All right. So why bother to save seeds? I mean, isn't that what, you know, our grandparents did? You know, why, why in the modern age do we need to save seeds? So I have three major reasons why I personally save seeds. Um, the first is thrift. So, you know, some people might call me a little um, on the miserly side with my gardening dollars. And there are certain things I want to invest in and certain things that I know I can get from free from my own garden. So why would I bother? paying for them. The second is variety and maintaining certain lines. So that could be a certain flower that I love in my garden every year and want to have every year available to me. It could be um, an heirloom that somebody passed along to me. It could be just that I enjoy selecting for a certain flavor of say tomato and every year I want to select a sweeter and sweeter or it could be a more savory and savory tomato in that variety and then eventually I might even have what would be called my own tomato at that point selected from that seed line. Um, and related to that is I'm a big believer in local sourcing and buying local and that things with local provenance um, usually do better in your area. So say a coneflower, which is in this picture here, um, has reseeded itself for a few generations. I know that that is a successful plant in my growing zone and were I to pass it off to other gardeners in my growing area, I know that they would probably, most probably, have success with that plant. Um, whereas maybe a coneflower that was collected outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, might not do as well for us here in the Mid-Atlantic. And then the third reason is um, for passing on to others. So I host a National Seed Swap Day. Um, so if you go to seedswapday.com, you'll see 
the last Saturday of January every year was officially named National Seed Swap Day, and I encourage seed swaps to take place across the country in and around that date. So if they take place two weeks earlier or two weeks later, I still count them as National Seed Swap Day. And locally here in the DC area, we host one in Virginia and one in Maryland. And for those seed exchanges, I'm bringing a lot of seeds from my garden, but I'm also enjoying the benefits of a lot of seeds from other people's gardens in my local area. So swapping and exchanging seeds would be my third biggest reason for seed saving. And if you have other reasons for seed saving, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, and I'd love to see them. All right, so we're going to go over today mainly how to save seeds and in this picture here the photo that i posted this is an outdoor seed saving clinic i gave in a community garden a couple years ago and you'll see my tools or tricks of the trade in this photo um, so you're going to see brown paper bags white paper envelopes some snips uh, glass jars and then some dried seed heads which we'll talk about in a bit but you can see that very low cost very easy the biggest tools and the most important tools you'll need for seed savings are at the end of your arms your hands and your brain obviously so let's go into probably the most complicated topic of what I'm going to discuss today and we'll get this out of the way um, and that's hybrid versus open pollinated seeds so uh, you've probably heard if you're a beginner or intermediate gardener that you've been told you cannot save seeds from hybrid plants and that those won't grow or something like that or they'll say um, don't save the seeds from hybrid pumpkins they'll never grow um, that's not true. They will grow. <laughs> what will happen is they will not grow true to what you had. So if you had this gorgeous tomato red torch that I grew last year, which is a F1 hybrid, um, were I to have saved seeds last year from that red torch and planted them this year, the tomato that would result would be probably something that looks a little like that red torch, but I bet it would be a solid red or it look, might look like one of its parents, but it would not be um, all chances and odds put together ever again a red torch. And I'll explain why here. So a hybrid is parent A plus parent B are put together sometimes in a lab sometimes in a field by cross pollinating them and coming up with C so I'm just gonna make up some names here and I'm gonna say tomato baby tomato boy creates tomato baby boy how's that but if I save seeds from tomato baby boy which was pollinated by itself tomato baby boy i will not get tomato baby boy if that makes sense and if tomato baby and tomato baby boy are crossed i'm still not going to get tomato baby boy How, does that make sense or if i cross it with one of the parents still not going to get that it has to be that combination of those two certain parents um, and You'll often see in seed catalogs the phrase F1 or F1 hybrid after the seed name, often in tomatoes. And that means filial one, literally first children or first child. So first generation hybrid. So that would be an A plus B equals C is an F1 hybrid. So it sounds like, you know, techie or whatever if you see the word F1, but they just mean it's a hybrid. Um, so why are we growing hybrids and you know why aren't we just open pollinating collecting seeds so there's a thing called hybrid vigor that when I cross tomato baby and tomato boy and make baby boy I get something stronger more disease resistant maybe even more insect resistant than if I had grown just baby or boy so there's just that concept 
of hybrid vigor that heirlooms don't have. And let's define heirlooms. Let's go into that a little bit. So an heirloom can be any collected seed passed down for generations. Generally, most seed companies are using pre-World War II as heirloom. Sometimes you'll see the word vintage as well, and that might be 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, as we're rounding now into 2020, I think that those dates are going to shift a bit, um, but those have been the definitions up until now is basically any time in memoriam up to World War II, sometimes people use World War I, um, and then the modern age, you might have some vintage varieties that are starting to be passed around, um, and then there's modern, so modern breeding. And open pollinated means that most of these heirlooms can be grown in a field and they will either self-pollinate or be pollinated by pollinators and they will not be crossed so they will stay true unlike the hybrid from generation to generation um, and we'll talk about some exceptions to that in a couple minutes all right i hope i didn't confuse anybody with that um, but that's to say you can save hybrid seeds. So if you wanna take a chance and you have a squash that you love this year, and I'm like, hmm, I just wanna save seeds from it, even though I know it's a hybrid and try to grow it next year, you might get something funky, you might get something different. It'll probably grow for you, it's not sterile. Um, but just know that you're not gonna recreate the same one. But if you want something coming true to seed, so to speak, then you're gonna stick with the open pollinated and the heirloom varieties. All right, so if I wanted to uh, breed a plant and I wanted to make sure that I was only collecting seed from that one variety, then I need to have certain spacing. And this is my community garden that's, that's in the photo here. And it would, probably not be possible um, for me to be able to have say a variety of cucumber and collect seeds from that and then pass them on to you and know a hundred percent for sure that um, those seeds are going to come up as that cucumber because as you see our plots are so close together that somebody else's cucumber over here could have a bee take that pawn and cross with my cucumber and so I'm fairly sure that the cucumber seeds I might pass on to another gardener, but at my seed exchanges, I might put a little asterisk or a warning that they came up to be what I think are the same cucumber, but that straight eight, that market more might be slightly different because uh, somebody else in there had a different cucumber. That often happens with squashes and pumpkins and gourds of all kind. The other time uh, that you really need to be scrupulous about cross-pollination is grains, especially corn, which is wind pollinated. So with corn, there would be absolutely no way in my community garden that I can guarantee the corn would not be cross-pollinated with another variety of corn um, from even 100 yards away, the farthest part of my um, community garden. So you'll see sometimes in seed saving books, they'll have distances spelled out. So they'll say, if you wanna make 100% sure that you're saving this open pollinated variety, that you cannot be within three miles of another person growing corn. And I don't know about you, but in my urban area, that's just not gonna happen. <laughs> so, um, but there is a Seed Savers Exchange Organization, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. They do have home gardeners saving specific seed strains for them. And you might be a small mom and pop farm way out in the country in Georgia, and you're able to, to grow just that one type of gourd, a whole field of it, and keep it isolated enough from all the other gourds in the area that you can guarantee and send those, seed, those heirloom seeds to Seed Savers Exchange. So if you're blessed with extra room and can, um, be uh, literally a seed saver for the Seed Savers Exchange. That's something to think about. And some people are really proud and rightly so 
that they are the ones saving that one variety of heirloom and they're the only ones maybe in the country who's perpetuating that one type of vegetable that one type that might be lost for generations if it's not grown out every year or few years to generate new seed inventory um, because as a lot of us know uh, we've lost you know, dozens, if not hundreds of varieties of vegetables that we see in old seed catalogs that are not available today. Um, some are being rediscovered slowly in people's attics and things and grown out, but we can't be 100% sure that some of them are true to seed again. Um, but give it some thought and it could be a, a fun pastime and a hobby. So um, just a, a side comment about wind hand and pollinator pollination um, so this is your female squash blossom on the bottom and your male squash blossom on the top and if i want to make really sure that i'm getting the zucchini that i want to grow from seed i will take the male flower off my zucchini and mate it put it together take touch this pollen to this pollen and make sure that I'm pollinating my own zucchini so that is one technique some people will take and even rubber band it together some people will just take a little say um, toothbrush or a watercolor brush and brush the pollen from one flower to the other some people will even put a baggie over it to make sure that then a bee doesn't come and get pollen from another neighboring squash and cross pollinate it. So that's something that a lot of people like to do just to ensure that that's the cucumber I have, that's the watermelon I'm getting, that's the pumpkin I'm getting, the, the one specific one I get. I kind of like to be surprised, but <laughs> it's up to you what you like to do and how much control you want in your garden. Um, the other reason you want to know about this is because this year especially, um, I've noticed and it had a lot of reports of lack of pollinators in our vegetable gardens. Some people are noticing that butterflies are coming super late this year especially. So if your squashes are not producing, if your cucumber is really slow to set fruit and you notice you have tons of male flowers and just a few female and they're not getting pollinated, then hand pollinating them to get a head start is a, is a really good method to know about. And it's just fun. Come on now. <laughs> All right. The other reason uh, we want to do seed saving is we want to select the best. So um, some people will go in their, um, say, cutting garden there, and they have a bunch of zinnias. So this is, say, my bunch of zinnias here. And I'm like, I like this ruby red one, and I really like the spotted one that popped up in my garden. And I'll enjoy it as it is in the garden. I might bring it in as a cut flower, <clears throat> but I'll usually just enjoy it out in the garden. And I'll come with a twist tie or a small piece of yarn and I'll put a tie around right below the blossom. So where my fingers are in this picture, I'll tie a piece of bright colored yarn. And then when the flower starts to dry up and form a seed head, I know that that's the seed head I want to save for next year. Um, so it could be that I love the color. It could be that it's taller, that maybe it doesn't get the powdery mildew. It could be that I noticed a lot more because of its openness right there versus these right here. A lot more bees and pollinators are attracted to it. So there are lots of different reasons I might be selecting that one flower or that one vegetable to save seeds from. And that's also to say, um, don't waste your time saving seeds from things that are just eh. So you had a cucumber this year and it was just okay. Do we need to bother saving seeds from it? If you can get, get or trade cucumber seeds from somebody else, don't bother. But if it was the best cucumber you've ever eaten and the best cucumber you've ever grown, save those seeds. So that's where you want to invest your personal resources. We're all short on time. We're all short on bandwidth in our own lives. So save the 
best um, and select for the qualities you want. So, and that could be highly personal and don't let anybody else tell you different. So if you like your um, watermelon to be more orangey than red, go for it. <laughs> so if you wanna select um, for the skinniest little zucchini instead of big growing zucchini, go for it. Whatever you wanna select for. So that's your personal best. But again, you have a little bit of time and we only have you know, annual growing seasons, so select the best that you can. All right, so we're gonna dive into first the dry method. Um, this is the majority of things you're gonna encounter in your garden is gonna be using the dry method. Um, so most of your beans, peas, sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Okra, everything in the carrot family, grains, most herbs, not woody herbs, and we'll talk about woody herbs in a, a bit later your most of your annual flowers, a lot of your perennials, et cetera. So everything pretty much but woody plants. Um, and then the um, Solanacea family, the nightshade family is gonna be the wet method. And ev most of the vining plants that we just talked about, squash, uh, cucumbers, melons, that's also gonna be the wet method. So we'll talk about that under the wet method. So dry method is pretty much everything else you're going to be finding in your edible garden. So up here on the top right are okra and this is an example of one of the easiest to do in my personal opinion. So I grow lots of okra. I love okra but every once in a while an okra can get away from you. You go away from the weekend and there's just one that grows a little bit too big and long and then it's too woody to eat and but I still wanna harvest it because I want the plant to keep producing okra pods. So I'll just set that one aside. And I have in my sunroom set up a series of um, laundry racks with old window screens on them. So I have levels of window screens and I'll just take that branch of the okra or those single pods and I'll lay them, just throw them on one of the window screens. That'll be my okra screen. Um, and just let them air dry like that. And that's in a protected sunroom. You could be doing that in your basement, in your garage, in a side porch. You want it to be obviously away from um, too much direct sunlight, wind, and then rain. But you know, the occasional wind or rain coming through my sunroom is not gonna hurt too much. Um, we do have a very humid mid-Atlantic climate, but I find, um, the sunroom works pretty well for me and a side porch works as well for a lot of people. Um, so that's just how I dry my okra. And then I might even trade somebody, I'll give them the whole okra pod, but I can also just split it open and take out the individual seeds and put those in an envelope. And the good thing about keeping the okra in their pod on those drying racks is I know they're okra. <laughs> because the second I take those little seeds out, I need to label them and put them in an envelope immediately. Um, and we'll talk more about labeling in a little bit. So that's a similar technique to, um, these are green beans that uh, you, you didn't harvest all your beans this year. So that's the other thing to note is that you wanna save a few things from your harvest. Sometimes we can get greedy and we pick all the peas and then we're like, oh darn, I forgot to save a few back for um, saving seeds. But the good thing is mother nature hides things from us. <laughs> and I find this almost every year that when I harvested all my beans or all my peas, so I thought when I go to pull up the plants, when they're drying out at the end of the season and I'm breaking them up to put them into my mulch pile, I'll always find one or two bean pods or pea pods that I missed and they're already halfway drying there for me. And it's like a gift from mother nature because I find that peas, especially in beans, um, will hide themselves among the leaves on the plant. And it's not until they start drying that you might even discover them. But you can also, of course, when you harvest your beans and peas, snip a few off, set them on screens to dry, and let them dry right away. Or 
they can dry on the plant and then you can harvest them there there and then you'll obviously be splitting these open labeling them and putting them in envelopes so winnowing doesn't need to happen for beans peas okra um, it does for the small things like grains and a lot of the annual flowers where you're getting a taking a whole head um, say a marigold head where you're separating sometimes you can easily pull out the seeds and leave the chaff but other times you need to use i use generally a big open manila folder and i'll drop the seed heads in kind of in the v if you guys can see me on my screen <laughs> and i'll blow gently and i'll do this outside on a calm day do not do this in a day where there's any breeze you don't need that to winnow for you um, and you kind of shake for the heaviness for the seeds to go to the bottom and then gently blow and after usually two or three gentle blows um, you're separating out most of the chaff from the seed because usually the seed is a little heavier because mother nature made it that way so that when a flower opens up on a plant the seeds drop to the ground and the rest fly away in the wind right um, that's how mother nature does it and i hear rain outside and i'm so happy you guys you don't know how happy i am right now <laughs> yay so i'm going to talk about some individual plants that i find really fun and easy to um save seeds from so lettuce uh, i wanted to say lettuce plants bolts but i i'm not a big one for puns <laughs> so letting plants bolt and go to seed um, so lettuce kales and arugula um, if you're a beginning gardener, you'll hear the term bolting all the time. Somebody will say, oh, my lettuce started bolting and now I can't eat it anymore. Well, guess what? It's still edible when it bolts. I can still eat this bottom foliage of the arugula and the lettuce and the kale here. I can still eat that bottom foliage. But what's happening is the plant is sending all its energy into making a flower head and then producing seed. So all the good sugars that were down here in the leaves are sent up here, all that energy, and the leaves taste a little bitter, I guess you would say, They're, they lack in flavor. So it's still technically edible. You could still maybe throw them into a green smoothie, um, just not as flavorful. Um, so those are great to let to go to a seed and bolt and form their flowers and then I come along once I start to see the flower heads just beginning to dry up I'll come with some snips floral snips and I'll cut off the whole stalk all the way down and then pull up the plant and compost the rest and I tie a bunch together usually I'll rubber band a whole section of the lettuce together rubber band it hang it upside down and in my sunroom or somewhere else dry and away from um, humidity as much as possible and then i'll take and i might scroll back to a previous slide here's a brown paper bag and my handy brown paper lunch bag i'm going to put that brown paper lunch bag around the drying heads when they're almost totally dry so I'll come maybe every week and I might put a tickler in my iPhone or my calendar to say, check on the seeds. And when they're about to the stage of 90% dry, they're about to burst on me, I'm gonna put that them into a brown paper bag and then put a rubber band around it. And before I put the rubber band on those uh, flower seed ends, I'm gonna label with a big marker or sharpie uh, arugula kale lettuce could, and then the if i know the specific variety i'll put the variety and i'm gonna put the date so it could be like june 2020 um purple moon kale that i grew this year and then um you want to have that bag on there beforehand because you're going to let it dry the last 10 percent of the way so you got it 90 percent of the way and you can hold it by the stem end and then give it a good shake after a couple weeks and then like give it a really hard good shake like a rattle and the little tiny lettuce seeds and kale and arugula seeds will fall to the bottom of the bag and you can shake out the stems take off the rubber band and discard the, the stems and then you have all those tiny little seeds at the bottom of the bag for you um, i find this 
a hundred times easier than sitting at an open table and opening up those seeds and then having them spill over because these are basically the size of you know tiny pin marks um, and especially lettuce if you've ever opened a package of lettuce seeds they're they're just so tiny um, and this is worth it for me to harvest my lettuce seed and let some go to seed and bolt every year because lettuce seed needs to be the freshest seed every year in order to germinate. Um, lettuce has the lowest germination rate and lowest storage ability. Um, so you'll see on seed packs, you want for 2020 seed packs, you want 2020. If you've got 2019 lettuce, you might have 50% or less germination rate, which we'll talk about germination rates in a little bit here. Um, but even at the seed exchanges, I'll hold if there's older seeds, I'm fine with almost every older seed variety. Like if somebody brings a pack of 2013, um, I don't know, pumpkin seeds or something, probably have a pretty good germination rate as long as they were stored correctly out of um, moisture. But lettuce seed is one of the things you want to have the freshest seeds. Um, so that you'll notice also that lettuce seeds are not the cheapest seeds. Um, so that's another reason why you might want to save your lettuce seeds. All right, we'll go on to my new favorite seed to uh, harvest and save every year are radish seeds. Um, so when radish seeds go to flower and bolt, they form these really funky, cute little, they almost look like little Oompa Loompas, right? These little guys, <laughs> these little two set guys. They always have this like two with a little pointy hat on them. So when they're fresh, these seed pods are edible and they taste just like a mild radish. Um, so they're really fun to just snip a bunch of these off and throw them on top of a salad or you can stir fry them or saute them and you can like fool your friends and serve them this exotic vegetable that they've never heard of and they'll be like wow it tastes a little like radish and you're like yeah it is <laughs> so that's fun so you can save some of them um, just to eat green and fresh and then the rest you're gonna dry and again you can hang them upside down, you can set them on window screens, and this is the dried pod, uh, one of them that I just opened up um, yesterday, and it had a few radish seeds in it. And then bonus, the radish seeds are also edible. So they're kind of crunchy. I'm not gonna compare them too much to sesame seeds because sesame is more mild flavor, but they kind of have that like light airy dryness. So if you're looking for a fun substitute or something to add a little bit of, um, you know, crunchiness to a salad, um, this is fun. So save as many radish seeds as you can, because of course you also want to save some for growing next year. Um, but you can eat the greens, you can eat them when they're in the seed stage. You don't want to eat this dried pod. Discard the dried pod. That <laughs> is definitely woody and yucky. Um, and then the third bonus thing from radishes, when you let them go to flower, the flowers themselves, they're cute pink little, I wish I had put a photo of the radish flowers. I'll try to add that in my next talk. Um, cute pink little flowers that you can snip off and use to decorate your salad. And they have a very, very light, mild radish flavor to them as well. Almost a little cabbagey flavor. Um, so if you're into edible flowers, you got three extra bonus harvests just from letting your radishes some of them stay in the ground, don't harvest all your radishes, let them bolt, form flower, and go to seed. And you got three extra harvests just from radish. All right, so dill. So um, this is a big plastic um, like tub that I used to collect dill into because I didn't have a big enough brown paper bag. <laughs> so I would normally take a big grocery bag and go to the garden and snip off the dill and put them all in that. But this, these dill were so big. And um, so I just put them in this big open tub and left it open. Don't put the lid on because then you'll have a humid environment. So I just let them dry in the tub like that. And then you see the tiny seeds. And then I just shake them out over the tub um, pretty aggressively to, to get most of those seeds off and then collect the dill seed um, that's collect to 
collected obviously in the bottom of the tub and that was a pretty easy process um, and I like the seed heads they're just pretty and then I I might compost them but I might stick them in a jar for a fun decoration on the side and I do want to say if you're in a community garden um, check the compost pile every once in a while so every once in a while i'll walk by our compost pile and they'll be like hey i can't believe this person threw this out in the compost pile and <laughs> this was one of the things i found one day in the compost pile a big pile of cut off dill branches and somebody had pulled all the dill out of their plot and just threw it on top of the compost pile just like this and i was like are you crazy so yeah every once in a while you find some some good salvaged glory in that compost pile all right so i'm going to go on to one of my next favorite things to grow uh for seed especially so cilantro this is uh fresh cilantro here on the right and then this is the collected cilantro seed also known as coriander on the left um, so a lot of people are not fans of cilantro I happen to love cilantro myself but you might still want to grow it for the coriander for the seed and if you're British and you're listening to this out there then you know this both as coriander and coriander but here in America we we refer to the plant as cilantro and the seed as coriander and as we know, this is a yummy seed in itself. And I forgot to mention, of course, dill seed is edible and a great thing to use for pickling and other things, but do save some seed back for next year and to trade with others. And then of course, save enough cilantro that you can have plenty to eat and also to grow for next year. Okay, and then my other favorite herb to save the seed from our basil plants. So throughout the growing season, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna snip off as soon as I see this flower head start to form. Um, so for the first several weeks of the plant, I'm gonna snip that flower head. I don't want it to go to flower and form seed yet. I'm gonna keep going in and pinching out that top flower head uh, because I want the plants to grow as big and bushy as possible and have as many leaves as possible so I can make some great pesto, right? But then usually around this time of summer when it gets to be really hot and you're like, I'm slowing down on the pizza and the pesto, but usually towards end of July, early August, I'll start to let some of my basil go to flower. And so you'll see little flowers and then they're starting to form the seeds. And these are the seeds up and down the stalk and they'll soon turn brown. Um, a side benefit of letting it go to flower mid to late season for me is that the pollinators go insane. <laughs> and there's no flower in my vegetable garden that attracts more bees than the basil when it goes to to flower so it is just like a buzz full of of pollinators so they go to town on it and then i snip off the flower stalk and um then i'll put that in an envelope and then save that and check on that every once in a while i won't snip off the whole plant because i want to keep keep that growing and the leaves still growing and I'm still harvesting from it. But I could, at the end of the season, snip the entire plant off and hang it to dry and dry the basil leaves as well as the seeds. Um, so now's a good point uh, in the talk to talk about self sowing or self um, seeding is sometimes the term people use. So a lot of these herbs I just talked about, the basil, the cilantro, the dill, and eh, sometimes the radish. If you're a lazy gardener, like some of us can be, or your garden gets away from you, you know, sometimes you just don't have the time or you go on vacation for a couple weeks, you might come back to some of these um, herbs and vegetables going to seed on their own. And sometimes I'll purposely let them form flower heads and go to seed in the garden. So I know that that part of my garden, I'm not going to mulch. And then next early spring, I'm gonna start looking for baby basil seedlings to come up. And it's good to have a guide 
to know what a baby basal, basal seedling sorry, looks like and be able to differentiate that from little weed seedlings coming up. To, so I'm letting it self-sow in the garden so I don't have to do the work of saving the seeds. It's sowing itself right there in the ground where it was growing for me. So um, I was just about to say there's a really good uh, seed company um, it'll come to me in a minute that has um, a nice display of what the baby seedlings look for each plant in their catalog um, so that when you're germinating them in seed trays indoors or direct sowing them in your garden you can recognize what that baby seedling looks like versus a weed and after you know several years of gardening you'll start to learn yourself and recognize it right away what a basil seedling looks like versus a crabgrass seedling or um, pokeweed or something else but it'll come to me I'll probably remember during the chat session so bear with me I'll remember that soon so our next seed saving for in the dry method I just wanted to mention quickly so mostly we're talking about edibles today um, although marigold is an edible flower um, I find it important when I'm growing edibles to always have a side dressing I almost call it or a border around a lot of my edibles of annual flowers and that is to attract the pollinators to come and pollinate the rest of my garden. Um, so I always have a row of marigolds around my tomatoes. I always have cosmos on the edge and I usually have cleome and a lot of times I'll have celosia too. So C-E-L-O-S-I-A, celosia or, or plume flower is also known by. Um, and those are all super easy annual flowers to just snip off the seed head dry them and save them every year um, and also let them self sow so those three plus celosia are easy to let self sow in place and to collect and gather from year to year for the garden I especially like cosmos and have been selecting more and more as you can say see pink so this is from the shell um, heirloom uh, collection of cosmos and I've been selecting all the shell pinks every year uh, for the light pink color not the dark pink and the white just for fun just because I like it <laughs> so um, you could certainly do a similar selection if you'd like to as well this is going to be our midpoint break for questions up till now yeah you've got a whole, whole bunch of questions I was gonna say I probably have a ton because I've been talking a lot no it's been great and great. thank you so much and uh, Corey, Corey and Thomas and I've been trying to answer some of them but here's um, up uh, uh, do you have to leave okra on the plant until it dries up you don't but it's so quick like it's almost a matter of days even a week after it's gotten from the nice four inch I, I would say finger size okra that's like the perfect tender okra for harvesting to when it gets woody and long um, I would snip it right then but yeah you want the plant to keep producing as much as possible so the more you harvest from okra the more pods it produces so try to get it when it's just entering that woody stage when you feel it when you're like Ugh, I don't want to bite into this um, that's when I snip it off and I set it aside. Great. Once a plant bolts, can you cut off the part that is starting to flower? And then salvage the rest. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately, no, you can do that and you can try to prolong it. But usually at that point, the, the plant has decided um, to give up the ghost, so to speak. They're like, I've, I've put all my energy. I'm, it's usually because of too long of days too hot um, at the end of the season and you'll no longer have that sugary goodness in the leaves at that point you can cut off the bolting flower and try to get another week or two out of it I've tried in the past also to throw a cover cloth that Rime spun fabric over it to hold off the bolting just a little bit longer like all of us want to have that spinach right just a little bit longer and hold it off um, but these days I kind of give up on that and I'll put a cover cloth over it 
to give me a week or two more, but I'll at a certain point just let it go to flower and seed. And at least I know I'm getting a second harvest by saving the seeds out of it. Is there any difference between allowing seeds to dry on the plant versus drying them inside? Um, there's a couple differences in why you might want to do it inside versus outside. Um, one, in the mid-Atlantic here where I'm speaking from, we have super humid and hot summers and you can get fungal issues sometimes on the outside uh, when it's left in the garden. So if you had like thunderstorms every evening and really humid August and September, um, you might not, it might turn black and fungal. So you might want to bring it in to dry. That might be one reason. The other reason is, and a lot of the reason I leave my seed heads up on perennials like coneflower, uh, black eyed Susan and Joe pie weed is because birds love those seed heads. Well, guess what? <laughs> By the time they're dried outside on and left on the stem, the birds will get to them or squirrels will get to them first. And there's also other rodents, of course, that will also eat the seeds outside. So you can leave some outside for wildlife, but snip off some when you start to see it drying. It's just easier to dry it inside and control it that way. Great. We've got about, we've got about three or four more questions. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way to find out, do you have any tips for um, finding out whether a seed needs uh, to be uh, cold stratified or scarred? So um, usually you can consult, uh, you know, there's always Dr. Google. But, um, most of them uh, for vegetable seeds do not need to be. The, if we're talking about say native perennials, a lot of them do need to be. So it's really a little bit of research, maybe talking to fellow gardeners. Um, there's lots of Facebook seed groups for native seed growers because there are those tricks that a lot of them do need that cold winter outside. So either they need to be put into refrigeration in your refrigerator for six to eight weeks to simulate winter time. Um, but sometimes it's as uh, easy as just being a little intuitive to where this plant came from and what its original environment was. So if I know say I'm going to use tulips even though we're not going to save tulip seeds they came from the sides of the mountains in the Mediterranean they want dry shale type really good drainage and I know that they need a cold winter exposure to trigger that process and then other seeds might be tropical so I know that they obviously don't need that cold winter process Great, thank you. So one uh, gardener says, I interplanted my radishes with parsnip this year. Will they cross pollinate? And if so, is it safe to eat the hybrids? Nope, so radish, parsnips, two totally different plants, so they're not gonna cross. If you had two or three types of radish side by side, that could cross. Mm. Um, same thing if you had carrot, 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 and they were all three different variety, or you had carrot and parsnips, which are very close relatives, that could cross. But if they were heirloom, open pollinated varieties to begin with, probably you're okay. Uh, I'm going to say that you're okay for those. Great. Um, does mildew and disease stay with seeds? Um, you mean from... I guess they're asking from generation to generation. Yeah, I think they're wondering if they take it from the plant, mm -hmm. uh, is it likely? You That's know, already a diseased plant. Is, is it, right, is it gonna have, yeah. it, or is it just gonna be susceptible to it? it so, um, exactly what you said. So probably it's not gonna carry in the seed itself, but the genetic susceptibility um, that it's, and that's where it goes back to my point of saving the best, so don't save diseased plants. So if you have a tomato that always has horrible um, fungal issues, even though you might love the taste of that tomato, you know that probably any of its children are gonna have those same horrible fungal issues. And you might wanna try to select year after year for the one that's the most resistant to those disease issues. 
Okay, and the last question, thank you for being so patient, is um, Owen Gardner wants to know if there's any guide you can recommend that would show you what a plant looks like um, when it's fairly young so that you can know you're not ripping out a weed. Yes, so I was mentioning that um, that seed company and it's coming to me. Ah, I got it. It just bumped in my brain. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's <laughs> Park Seed. So they are out of North Carolina, I believe, and I think it's Park Seed Company. And if I'm wrong, I'll, I will send you guys an email, but I think that's the link I saw. If you go into their individual seed pack on their website to each of the seed pages and you drill down a couple levels, you'll see a picture of the tiny seedling next to each plant. So I'll check that out in a minute. If somebody maybe who's I'll watching people on the side, that would be perfect. But I'm pretty sure it was the Park Seed Company. Um, so we'll check that. Now we're going to dive into, an, a, no pun intended, dive into the wet method of seed saving. Um, so this is what we're going to use for those juicy plants that we love to eat, right? tomatoes, squashes, melons, etc. So in general, what we're trying to do when we're using the wet method is we're trying to get the plant to go through its fermentation process um, and then rinse it and clean it and save those seeds for next year. So these are plants that if they were in the wild, um, a tomato plant, you know, say in Central America just pops up, the fruit would rot on the plant itself and then the seeds would probably get eaten by a bird and distributed elsewhere so that's its natural process so we're trying to speed up and get that natural process to happen so we can save those great seeds for our gardens all right so this is the easy way of tomato seed saving and there's a, a lot of hard ways to save tomato seeds. Um, and this is the, mo the one that was told to me by Trudy of wintersown.org. And Trudy is a good friend of mine and I adore Trudy. And if you go um, to her Facebook page, Winter Sown, S-O-W-N, you'll also learn all about winter sowing, which is a whole other fun world of seed growing. <laughs> so, um, especially for those in Northern climates. So, um, Tomato seed saving the easy way. So first, you're gonna take a nice, juicy, ripe, fully ripe tomato. It can't be green, gotta be fully ripe. So you're gonna smush it up. You, maybe you can have a little kids help you out with this as well. Smush up the pulp and put it in a strainer and um, strain it over a bowl. You can set aside the pulp to use to make tomato sauce or something else. Take out the big chunks of pulp and you just want the seed capsule that's inside that gelatinous kind of gooey covered seed capsule. Um, and you're gonna strain out and take all the big chunks and all the liquid you can and kind of push it to the bottom of the strainer. Then when you have just the seeds with their gel around them, um, I like to use these little um, ramekin cups uh, to do this. And you're gonna use a household cleanser. I'm gonna use a, a, a name. This is a generic version of Comet. So you can just use any generic Comet. Um, some people use bleach. I find that a little harsh. Some people use baking soda, which you can do, but um, there can sometimes be fungal issues in saving tomato seeds with just the um, baking soda. So you're gonna sprinkle a bit of that on top. You're gonna mix it up. It's gonna get frothy. So it's just gonna get a little frothy and bubbly in that little bowl. You're gonna set it aside and you're gonna put a timer. See, there's a little froth worked up there. You're gonna set the timer for 30 minutes. Uh, at the end of 30 minutes, when the timer goes off, you're going to pour that back into the strainer and what's happening is, and why we're doing this whole crazy, crazy operation is that you can't see very well in the left-hand picture, but that gel pack that's around each of the tomato seeds needs to be broken up and scrubbed off. You cannot access the seed when it still has that gel coating on it. So what we're doing with the cleanser is breaking through that gel coating, opening it up, 
and getting clean seed. So if you've ever tried to by hand take apart a tomato and kind of squeeze by hand the little tiny tomato seeds out of that gel, you'll know how crazy and hard that is to do. Um, so the way we're doing it here, again, is the 30 minutes of the cleanser to break up that gel and then put it through the strainer. And then you're gonna do a couple rinses. You're gonna use a couple drops and you'll see I've got it down to just the seeds right there, a couple drops of any dishwashing liquid and then give it a final cleaning and pressing against there. And I've got it down to just the seeds at that stage and then rinse it again. And then you're going to put them on a metal cookie sheet or pan. It could be something lined with aluminum foil, say. And I have my big note here that when you use the wet seed method, dry it on a metal surface. And um, there's lots of people online that will say things like, put it on paper plates <laughs> or something like that. Please never do that to yourself. You will never be able to pry up those poor little tomato seeds after you just did all this work right here that we just talked about and then they stuck to the paper. So please don't use paper uh, uh, paper plates or anything. You could use old pie plant pie tins, um, aluminum foil like I said. I like to use these old cookie sheets that I've saved and then I go one extra step and you'll see my bookshelf here. I put the seeds to dry up on a high bookshelf and out of the way because the worst thing is you'll walk by a table with these seed trays on them and you'll accidentally hit it with your elbow or something and these tiny seeds go flying. Or like me, you have two very curious cats who would walk across this tray, throw these seeds all around, and sleep on here if I were to leave this seed tray on a table out for drying. So I have to hide my drying rack, so to speak. But if you can have somebody build a little drying rack for you, that would be great too. Um, and maybe somebody to occupy your cats and dogs and small children. So they're not always trying to get into your seeds that you're saving. So then I'll immediately package up my seeds and label them right away. So this is the easy method um, versus letting your tomatoes ferment, which is what we have to do with the other fruits and vegetables that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then I'll just do a quick aside on peppers because uh, Mother Nature gave us a huge break with peppers. You'd think that peppers and tomatoes, because they're close relatives, would be the same exact way of seed saving, right? But guess what? When you cut open a pepper, we all know when we cut open that bell pepper or the hot pepper, um, the seeds are right there and they don't have that gel around them. They don't, they're not encapsulated by that thick mucus gel. And thank you, Mother Nature. So all you have to do is scoop those seeds out, set them aside, eat your pepper, give them a quick rinse, the seeds, and then spread them out on a metal surface to dry. So peppers are like, like the easiest of the wet method to do. And they're like the least wet of the wet method. And they don't need fermentation. They don't need any other step. Um, now, eggplant is kind of in between the tomato and the pepper. You will have to pry the seeds out. And a lot of times people will take the seeds out when they're preparing and cooking because they just don't like the texture of the seeds in the eggplant. Um, but you don't need to go through the whole process that we talked about for tomatoes for eggplant. Once you separate the eggplant seeds out, you can just dry, give them a rinse and dry them. So for all the rest, melon, squash, cucumber for the wet method, those will need to be fermented and then separated and cleaned. If you've ever left a cucumber on the vine too long at the end of summer or a, maybe a little cantaloupe or something else, you'll know the stink, right? The smell <laughs> of the rotting fruit. Um, so you're gonna have to bear with that a little bit. Some people, uh, seed companies especially, will have separate areas with fans on them just for this process. So this is a little um, up on the upper left. This is the Queen Anne pocket melon. And it's literally the size of a little bit 
bigger than say a tennis ball. It's an heirloom melon um, that ladies used to have in their pockets as a kind of self deodorizer for the day. It has a, like a really light melony scent to it. Um, and it wasn't even for eating. It was just used for that. And it's just a cute little melon. So that's a fun heirloom to try this with. So you're going to break open the melon or your watermelon or your cucumber, your squash. You're going to scoop out the flesh with the seed. You're going to leave the flesh with it. So that pulpy part that you pull out of the pumpkin or that you scoop out of any squash or out of the middle of your honeydew, you're gonna, you want that pulpiness. You don't wanna separate it at that point. And you're gonna use a big glass pickle jar or a bucket, a clean bucket. So it's gotta be clean jar, clean bucket. Um, if I were to do this whole watermelon, scoop out the seeds, I want some of the flesh with it. And then I'm gonna add uh, just enough water to cover. And then I give it a good stir. And then you're going to set it aside without a lid on. So you don't want to create like a little universe inside there where it's just going to explode when it starts to ferment. You're going to leave it without a lid on. Some people say a week. Some people say a month. Most people say two to three days is fine to start the fermentation process. So two to three days later, you're gonna check on your jar or your bucket, shake it up, and you'll start to see separation. The seeds should be going to the bottom and the pulp and liquid should be above. It should be pretty easy to separate it at that point. So you can just decant it, give them a, a good rinse in a colander, and then again, lay them out on metal sheets or aluminum foil or what, what you have. Again, never watermelon on paper. If you've ever put watermelon seeds out on paper, <laughs> you know uh, the horror that is. And then label it and package it. So that's basically the wet method, the fermentation process in a nutshell. Um, some varieties, again, people will do longer but I find uh, two to three days is just fine. Okay, so I told you earlier I would talk about some seeds that you don't bother saving, um, and those are the woody herbs, and those are generally the Mediterranean herbs, rosemary, lavender, oregano, I'm trying to think of some of the others, um, sage, very, very difficult to save from seed, very difficult to start those herbs growing from seed, much easier to get a um, section or to propagate from a stem cutting from those herbs. So if a friend has a lavender, you can get a cutting from that and propagate from that rather than to try to start them from seeds. Same thing with most fruits, like it's fun and easy to think about. You get an apple from a market or a peach pit and you could stick it in a pot of soil and let it go and see what it comes from it. But the timeline from growing an apple seed to actually having an apple is going to be about 15 to 20 years in many cases. So uh, might be a fun thing to try with a kindergartner, but most of us don't have that type of patience. But I do want to talk about one fruit seed that I do recommend you save, and that's a lot of fun, um, and that is the pawpaw. So that pawpaw is a native fruit um, to the Americas and pretty prolific in the mid-Atlantic area through the Midwest. So if you ever go to a pawpaw tasting or festival in the fall, usually it will be around early September that most of them would happen. This is when you want to um, get your pawpaw and it usually has about eight of these large kidney bean sized black seeds and just like tomatoes it has this gelatinous sac around each of the seeds um, and you want to keep that gel sac around them because um, what we found over the years is what people would do is they would go to the pawpaw festivals or have a friend who was growing a pawpaw and they would get the seeds and they would save them, like they would suck off the gel and they would dry them thinking they need to dry them and then store them for planting next year. Well, guess what? Dry pawpaw seeds will never germinate. Never germinate. You have to keep them wet 
always. So the one thing you can do is come home from the festival, plant it right away. Plant it in a big pot or directly in the soil while it's still wet. If you don't want to plant it right away, if you want to save it to trade with somebody or just save it for next growing season, then you're going to wrap it in a paper towel, put it in a plastic baggie, and keep it in your refrigerator crisper drawer. And then you're going to put a big note on it that says Papa Seeds. Because then you'll be like, what is this gross baggie in the bottom of my drawer? <laughs> but never let it dry out. So it's one of those seeds that you should never let dry out or it won't germinate anymore. So that's a fun one to do. And guess what? From seed to fruit for pawpaws, eight to 10 years. And really easy for them to start from seed. Um, you can, of course, get divisions of pawpaw seeds, but it's fun and easy enough to grow a couple of pawpaw seeds. So that's a fun experiment to try. Do want to have a quick note about storing seeds. Um, the enemy of seeds is moisture. So you'll see a lot of um, places will say save seeds in a cool dark place. Well temperature is great not to cook them and darkness mm, that's fine. Uh, it could be exposed to some sunlight. The key is never let it be moist except for the pawpaws which we just talked about always have to be moist but everything else should be kept perfectly dry because when they're exposed to moisture then they start the germination process and then stop of course because they have no nutrients or water or sunlight when they're in the seed pack so my method of storing seeds is in old jars so i keep also um besides a tight lid on them and labeling them if they're not already in an original seed pack i can just stick um I can either write on the lid or stick a sticker on the outside. I also save my silica packets from when you buy, you know, shoes or um, other clothing or handbags. I'll throw a couple of silica packets in there. So I find those really great to have that silica sand in there to keep it very dry. Because I said the Mid Atlantic were such a humid environment, and the worst thing to way to save seeds in our environment is in those plastic shoe boxes that you get at the craft store. Plastic holds in humidity and you'll have a moisture ring sometimes around there. Glass works much better. Also plastic baggies, not the best to have them in big plastic baggies. Um, a paper envelope inside glass jars and lining them up on a shelf where you can see and be proud of all the seeds you saved. How's that? <laughs> so um, those are always fun to do. And then us uh, labeling I wanted to talk about. And if you have old seed packs from when you originally grew that radish or that lettuce, save those seed packs. And then you can either copy or scan them in um, and make new labels, or you can at least copy off of them for the seeds that you saved from that plant. Um, and at our website, washingtongardener.com, we have an easy folding method to make your own seed packs out of old seed catalogs. Um, so what I've learned over the years to do is I save seed catalogs and the page from the seed that I want to save, I'll rip that section and actually use that for the seed packet. So I have that little description right there on its packet as well. And that's a fun thing to do like on a winter evening um, when you're watching TV is to fold up some seed packets. My friend Trudy, who I'd mentioned earlier, who does the winter sown process, she uses these little um, jeweler plastic bags that I find really nice and she um, makes copies on her computer Avery labels so these are the 30 up address labels you get on a sheet from Avery or office supplies and then she has her little color printer where she's putting the actual picture and then a really good description with her contact information on there um, so our, our final note on seed saving is testing the germination rates uh, so we talked about lettuce having a really low germination rate once it's old seed but say you have a seed pack or you save seeds and put them away in a drawer and forgot about them and it's five seven ten years down the road and you're like are these seeds worth <laughs> saving or even using again um, so an easy way to test the germination rate is to take 10 of those seeds. So if you had saved like 30, take 
10 random seeds, put them on a wet paper towel in a row, and then gently roll them up and put them in a baggie and then set that baggie aside. You don't need to put it in the sunlight or anything. Just set that aside and make sure that the, the paper towel stays moist and the baggie is fully closed. Then check back in a week to 10 days and then you'll count how many of those seeds out of the 10 have germinated and that's your germination rate. So if three, one, two, three, out of the 10 germinated, that's a 30% germination rate. If all 10, then that's 100% germination rate, and so on. Um, in general, if things are below 50% germination rate, most people would discard the seeds. But uh, one of my philosophies is not to be wasteful with things. And what I tend to do is just plant heavier. And if I were to give these seeds to another gardener, I would tell them, this has a low germination rate plant extra. So in every uh, pea hole that I was planting, I would put three or four peas in there instead of just the one or two. Or I might even put five or six if I thought it had a really low germination rate just to guarantee that I had that percentage germinating. So I plant more thickly and more of the seeds if I think it's a low germination rate rather than just completely discard the seeds if it's something that I feel is worth it. All right, so um, I talked quickly about seed exchanges and seed swaps and this is a picture from my annual seed exchange um, that we host at Brookside Gardens this year. Um, there's tons of online forums both on Facebook and elsewhere where you can swap seeds um, with people with usually just the price of a self-addressed stomped envelope. Um, sometimes people want to trade directly with you. They want a zinnia seed for a tomato seed. Um, but otherwise, most people are just super generous with seeds that once you get started seed saving, especially say marigolds or annual flowers, you have plenty to share with others. And they usually just ask for a self-addressed stamped envelope, as I said. Um, so this is a little quick information on our National Seed Swap Day. So if you do hold a local seed swap, let me know at National Seed Swap Day. And I'd, I'd love to add you to our list of seed swaps that are happening across the country on that day. And then a few further sources for seed saving. So these are three fairly recent books that I find to be really good overall guides. And the first one is Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. And these are all edibles. So it's about, I think it's 160 edibles that she's talking about in just this and how to save their seeds. Um, Complete Guide to Saving Seeds by Robert Goh. You see he has 322, but he's talking about all plants. So not just edibles, but everything that you could possibly save seeds from Robert is talking about. And then my friend Julie Thompson Adolph, hey Julie, if you're out there listening, she wrote a book a couple, uh, just recently actually, on starting and saving seeds. Her book goes the extra step to saving um, and not just the saving part, but she also talks about the starting part. So the person who had asked earlier about stratification or cold exposure or scarification, Julie's book is probably the one for you. So she talks not just about how to save that seed, what it might take to start that seed. Okay, and now I'm ready for the second set of questions. That was a lot of talking. I'm so happy everybody bared with me this far. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you, Kathy. This has been great. And I was just in the middle of answering a question from somebody who was asking about the seed swaps and that you do them with Washington Gardener. Can you say um, at Green Spring? And then where is it in Maryland again? So it's um, the last Saturday of January at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland. And then the first Saturday of February, usually at Green Spring Gardens in Fairfax County, Virginia. So we do have a number of questions, as you can imagine. The first one is, um, someone is trying to save seeds from their Southern Magnolia pods Ew. and is, uh, is really struggling with that. Do you have mm -hmm. any? That's a really tough one. Um, that's one of those plants that um, you might have to soak the seed or um, give it some special treatment 
but I would definitely consult an arborist to talk about. And I was trying to think of at the U.S. National Arboretum, depends on the magnolia you have, but Phil Normandy at Brookside Gardens is a sweet bag magnolia expert. So if you're anywhere near around Brookside Gardens, Phil is a great resource. And then at the U.S. National Arboretum, they have a breeding program for um, the, little, the saucer magnolias. So you could get in contact through the USDA and then the U.S. National Arboretum, which is under the USDA, um, for magnolia propagation tips. Excellent. Thank you. So somebody asked about um, using tins to save the seeds in. Mm -hmm. um, for like storage? Yeah, like instead of a glass jar or an, a paper envelope. Yeah, I think metal is a good alternative. And that's actually a point that I didn't talk about in seed saving is um, a lot of us, and meaning living creatures, eat seeds because they're yummy and they're nutritious and they're good for us. And that makes seed saving vulnerable to especially rodents. So that's another reason why I save in jars and also um, metal tins like tea tins or even your old Altoid tins would be a great resource to keep um, vermin out of your seed supply and your seed storage. And can you talk about like saving between like just like in a cool dry place versus in the refrigerator or freezer? Yeah, so most of us don't have climate controlled refrigerators or freezers like the big seed vault that we see, um, you know, in the, in the international stories for seed saving. Um, and we can, and we're constantly opening and closing it anyway. So there's temperature fluctuations in any case. If you had a separate freezer just devoted to seed saving in your basement, say, um, and you could keep it closed most of the time, that would be great. But that's really not necessary. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you store in like prescription bottles? Yes. So I do have a number of people who come to our seed exchanges with individual um, prescription bottles, and that's a great recycling use for them. Most of them are heavier plastic, so usually not going to be exposed to um, humidity coming and going um, like the thinner plastics would. Yeah, the, obviously you want to clean them out really well. Make sure to remove that old prescription label because, you know, somebody could use that if they came across it. So don't show up at a seed exchange with all your labeled prescription bottles <laughs> make sure to at least tear those off and put some new tape or uh, labels on top um, another canister that i've seen people use a lot are um the old and this is really dating some people right are the old film canisters personally don't recommend them because they're still leaching chemicals um in those film canisters but if you had like a little plastic envelope sleeve like the ones I showed you Trudy has. I can go back to that slide. These little guys and I stuck a bunch in the film canister. I would probably feel safe about them being in there but guess who can chew through plastic? Most rodents. <laughs> they want, usually can't get through the hard plastic of a prescription bottle but you know those old film canisters they're kind of like almost flexible. Um, they could get through that. Um, could you use a dehydrator to dry out the seeds? I don't recommend it because seeds have, even though we consider them dry and they're dry to the touch to us, um, they still have a little tiny germ in there of protein or nutrient for that plant to jumpstart and grow. Um, so if you were to totally dehydrate it, I think you're killing it. Like if you were to dry out rice, say, this, the rice that you buy in a bag at the grocery store, I couldn't just take a rice kernel and then plant it outside because it's been dehydrated and dried. Um, I hope that makes sense. It does. Thank you. And I just want to remind everyone, if you could please turn your mics off so that we can hear what Kathy is saying. Uh, can we dry on, how about drying on glass or Pyrex instead of on metal? Yes. So if you have enough um, glass surfaces or you had like a collection of glass bowls or something you want to use, that's perfectly fine. As 
I like the thin cookie sheets because like I showed you, I can hide them on bookshelves and store them up high and away from things. But yeah, glass bakeware would work perfectly fine. Great. And then the, the last question that I have right now is, um, can you save seeds from produce in the store or farmer's market? If you could just go back and address that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So there's some things you can save if it's a hybrid which most of what you're going to buy probably at the grocery store, um, most supermarkets are going to be carrying hybrid tomatoes. Then again, you can save the seed. You could grow it. Would I bother to? Probably not. Um, from the farmer's market, yes. If I was going to go to uh, my local farmer's market and buy an heirloom squash and talk to them about it and talk to them about how they grew it, how they sourced it, then I would absolutely 100% save those seeds if I enjoyed that squash. Um, so same thing from a local garden center. If I bought like a Halloween pumpkin that I thought was really cool looking, like one of those blue warty ones, and I was like, oh, I love this pumpkin. I, and I thought and had talked to the grower and knew that it wasn't a hybrid, that it was open pollinated or heirloom variety, then I would save the seeds from that and propagate it. That's great. And then um, also, if you could just address maybe if um, how you in the garden, how you manage um, harmful insects without using pesticides. Mm -hmm. So I just put up the next slide, which is my social media and contact information. So if you have questions that occur to you after this talk or you miss something, um, this is how to get in touch with me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest, and my blog and Facebook page. Um, so that's like a whole nother long, way more than an hour and a half talk <laughs> for insect control in the garden. Um, but I do garden organically. Um, I have a couple of philosophies about that. And one is grow enough to be able to share, um, knowing that a certain percentage is just going to be uh, either eaten by that baby bunny that I was talking about earlier before um, we started the talk or by insects coming around. So you just know as a gardener to know that a certain percentage is going to be taken by wildlife and I'm happy to share and have enough. Um, my other philosophy of course is that I'm not going to put anything on a plant that I wouldn't directly ingest. Um, so I use for fertilizer, I use a fish emulsion fertilizer um, and I only fertilize um, the plants really that are in the nightshade family. So the peppers, potatoes, um, tomatoes, of course, um, and eggplant. Most everything else in my edible garden doesn't need extra fertilizer because I have um, already amended the soil with organic materials and added, um, usually I, I add at the end of each season, I'll work in some aged um, animal manures uh, for next year for this soil. So does that prevent insects? My biggest way I'm stopping insect predation on my edibles is with a cover cloth. Um, so that's that spun fabric I referred to earlier. And there's several different brand names available. Remay, R-E-E-M-A-Y is one of the brands. But you'll also just see it called garden cover or cover cloth um, versus say using an old sheet which could tear down the seams really easily. The spun fabric holds together even in huge storms and I can put a stake through it and hold, hold it into the ground. Um, I really, uh, there's, I almost think that my garden plot sometimes of the year looks like a bunch of ghosts live in it because <laughs> there are certain crops that I almost never take the cover cloth off of except for when I'm harvesting it uh, because the cover cloth is thin enough that it allows sunlight through and allows rain through and allows me to water but it doesn't allow the insects to come in and put their eggs say if it's a cabbage moth or um, get to the plant the only ones that I have to not have a cover cloth on and leave open 
to the elements and to insects are those that uh -huh. need so, pollinators. Yes. Um, so that would be yes. squash and cucumbers. And something else. So I can't leave cover cloth right? over those all season. But I wish I could, because <laughs> that's been my best oh, method to keep good. insects off of my plants. Okay. That's great, thank you so much. And please mute your mic if you um, haven't done that. We can hear somebody coming in through there. Um, two other things to add on to what Kathy just said about insects is one, check out, like if you're on Facebook, her Washington Gardener page, there is a lot of traffic about, well right now squash bugs seem to be very popular, but. Oh, and Japanese beetles too. And Japanese beetles, but there's yep. a, it's a really great resource for asking those questions. And then the other thing I wanted to point out is that the Fairfax Food Council, we are Urban Ag Working Group is talking about um, having an integrated pest management workshop. So if you are interested, um, email Fairfax Food Council at fairfaxcounty.gov to join our mailing list. And Kathy, if you have time for one more question, just slid in here. Mm -hmm. Is parchment paper a good source, a good, um, good for surface drying? For surface drying. Yeah, I've tried it a couple times. I still find it to be a little sticky. Um, I also tried out wax paper once and I was like, mm, because I've used the, say, the, what is it, the cellulose um, envelopes too to save seeds in um, and thinking that was a more greener approach and I didn't love that either. Um, but if it's what you have on hand and it's the easiest to use, um, then go ahead and use it. Uh, but I didn't think it was the easiest to get the, the um, seeds back off of the metal. And like somebody else had suggested, the glass is just a lot easier to slide the seeds off and not have them stick or break or crack at that stage. And the same with foil, right? Foil's mm -hmm. pretty. Yep, and foil's pretty easy as well. And like I said, old pie plates that usually have at least a few around that you could use. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Well, I think I think that was all of our questions. You have like 30 seconds if you want to type something in very quick. If you want to look at the uh, chat, there's a lot of um, thanks and people. Oh, thanks everybody. Super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and it really I do. If nobody else has a question, I could say one more thing about insects. Um, and that's to know your insect ID. Um, so it's it's a lot of tendency, of course, when we see a bunch of insects congregate on one of our plants all of a sudden that we freak out. Um, but it could be a bunch of ladybugs or lady beetles just hatched right there that day and they and their little um, uh, stage or their little instar stage looks like a, you know a tiny crocodile and you'd never think that that is the ladybug that I want to have in my garden later and you might accidentally come and smush them all thinking this thing is eating my plant when it's just eating all the little aphids that are the ones actually eating your plant. Um, so it's good to get out there and have a resource. There's a, there's a really cool book called Good Bug, Bad Bug. That's like a flip book. Um, that's a good one to start off with for knowing the insects um, that are beneficial and not so friendly in your garden. And Thomas also just added that you can send uh, pictures to your local extension office to mm -hmm. have them ID'd. And yep. also, Kathy, are there any um, insect apps, anything you recommend? Um, I don't know if it, any apps that are very good for ID, but I do find um, I'm on several, besides Facebook pages, I'm on several local garden clubs have their own discussion lists. And so somebody will throw up a picture onto the list and say, this just arrived today. Um, is this something I should be worried about? So yeah, now that we all have digital uh, phones in our pockets at any time, that's a great thing to be able to take a picture and share with an extension agent or with your fellow gardeners to get a quick um, response. That's great. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for your time. This has been super informative. The recording will be on the Fairfax Extension YouTube and the VCE Prince William YouTube and also um, Diane Charles with Fairfax uh, Food Council will be sending the link to everyone who signed up. So thank you all for coming. Have a good night. And thanks again, Kathy. Thanks. Good night, everyone.